This is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News. Thanks for joining us today. Our webinar is titled Driving New Revenues with Policy Management and Subscriber Engagement. Our speakers today include Cher Levine, who is Directing Analyst with uh, Infinetic. She specializes in service enablement and subscriber intelligence. Our next speaker will be John Geary, who is CEO and President of Openway Mobility. And then finally, Michael Rogers will uh, close out the presentation. He's also with Open Wave Mobility. So, Shira, at this time, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and, and thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today on this webinar. So uh, just to provide sort of a bit of background, a bit of a uh, level setting for the rest of the, of the webinar, this, the information on this slide should be no big surprise to anyone. We've really seen mobile data usage explode over the last few years driven in large part by, by smartphone adoption. We've seen double-digit year-over-year growth over the last few years. And as consumers get their hands on these increasingly sophisticated devices, that's really driving their consumption of mobile data. The problem, though, is that spending on mobile data hasn't risen enough yet to compensate for that decline in voice revenue that we're seeing in many regions. The other issue is that with that increased consumption comes completely new usage behavior. Consumers are really relying more on their mobile services than they may have in the past, and they want these services to be always available and, and to be ubiquitous. And then, of course, there's that impact the video has on the network, particularly the mobile network, where we saw video traffic exceeding 50% of all network traffic in 2011. So at the same time, on a more macro level, we're seeing some economic and geopolitical issues that are having an impact on telecom. We're seeing ongoing high jobless rates in Europe as that region's debt crisis worsens, and that's led to a decline in global services revenue, particularly as the mobile market there hits saturation um, with well over 100% mobile penetration in some countries. We've also seen a political unrest in many countries, with, particularly within the Middle East and Africa, and that's been affecting uh, telecom service revenue as well. And these situations have really contributed to ongoing decline in ARPU and in subscriber losses in many regions, um, particularly, as I noted earlier, while data ARPUs are on the rise, they're simply not rising fast enough to counter the decline of voice revenue. Having said that, though, we are seeing an increase in CapEx spending as we enter a new investment cycle in telecom, and that's really driven by a few major initiatives, things like wireline broadband initiatives in some markets, uh, 3G rollouts in emerging markets such as uh, Africon Kala, and then, of course, a ramp up in LTE deployments in many of the more developed markets such as North America, uh, Western Europe, parts of Asia. The problem with network investments, though, is that operators really can't build them, themselves out of the congestion issues they're facing on the mobile side. And going back to video, it provides an excellent case in point. It's clear that consumers love their video, and they're not just consuming video for personal entertainment, such as Netflix, um, which accounts for over 20% of internet backbone traffic in the US, but video has also become part of consumer social communications. So things like um, viewing the latest viral YouTube clip or sending photos and videos to friends or relatives. And we're seeing devices such as smartphones and tablets becoming video conferencing devices. This trend isn't going to slow down anytime soon, particularly as new technologies such as HD phones and 3D video come out on the horizon. So what we're seeing is that by 2014, the average monthly traffic will be equivalent to 32 million people streaming an HD movie in 3D continuously for an entire month. And that's an enormous bandwidth requirement. And operators simply can't build out their infrastructure fast enough to support that, nor is it economically feasible for them to do so. And that's really where policy management comes in. Since operators can't build their way out of these issues, policy offers a way to better manage the impact on the network by offering more control over how network and services re service resources are being used. So while the earlier implementations of policy were more of a, a brute force stick approach, where policy systems were used to block or to throttle or otherwise shape network traffic, 
what we've seen over the last few years is the increasing interest in a, a kinder and gentler approach to policy. We call it the carrot approach, in which policy is being used to manage network and service resources by, by shaping and, and incenting subscriber behavior. And even more recently, we've seen interest in taking policy management capabilities even further and leveraging them to actually increase revenue per user by enabling new services and new capabilities. And as that occurs, the policy solutions on the market are evolving to meet these new models. So while originally policy control was local and router-based and generally limited to managing a single service on a single network, it's rapidly moving to be more dynamic. So for example, it being able to support multiple factors like time of day or application requirements, as well as convergent, able to span multiple services, multiple network types, et cetera. So then what comes next? Well, we believe is this concept that we call contextual policy, and, and open wave refers to as subscriber engagement, in which, in which policy management is tightly integrated with subscriber information in order to make policy decisions that are optimized for the specific subscriber. And by subscriber information, I mean everything from preferences or entitlements to the relative value of the customer or maybe the customer's likelihood to churn, which could impact the services and offers you want to make to your customer. It could include the customer's physical location. So say you wanted to offer a real-time uh, service or real-time offer that's specific to where the customer is at any moment. Um, another parameter could be network conditions. So for example, if you know how the network is performing and you know what services the subscriber is accessing and his relative value to you as an operator, you can then make decisions such as whether to maybe offload that customer onto Wi-Fi or, or onto another uh, associated network. And as it occurs, the value of what you're feeding into that policy engine becomes more and more important. Operators have this wealth of subscriber information at their fingertips, whether you're talking about IT data from systems like OSS and CRM, to billing data like call detail records, to network data from sources like the HLR or DPI systems. And once that data is consolidated in some way and then normalized, you can then derive some real value from it via analytics and turn it into information that can then be used to make policy decisions, to support things like value-added services and capabilities, more targeted services, and a more consistent customer experience, which are all valuable tools in, in reducing churn, optimizing the customer experience, and increasing revenue per user. So with that, I thought it'd be helpful to provide a few examples of what I mean in terms of use cases. So the first is leveraging these capabilities to address network congestion. So as I noted earlier, while more traditional earlier static policy solutions might have enabled an operator to deal with network congestion by throttling back all users or maybe uh, throttling certain high bandwidth applications like excuse me, like peer-to-peer -peer traffic. An alternative is a more subscriber-focused, contextual approach to policy management um, that, that enables more granularity. So for example, an operator could use a subscriber-aware policy solution to prioritize high-value customers during peak hours. And then by bringing charging into the mix, you create the potential to take that one step further you could charge the subscribers uh, who are not prioritized a premium for a temporary boost during peak hours. Let's say they're watching a video and they want a certain QoS for that specific period of time. And an integrated policy charging solution could enable the operator to charge different rates based on certain factors, time of day, or even where the subscriber is physically located. So you could maybe encourage a subscriber to use a specific underutilized cell site by charging a lower rate than if they were in a different location. And in that way, you can really do active, real-time network optimization. So for example, Zong, which is a mobile operator in Pakistan, 
does location-based charging in which the cost of a voice or data session varies by where the subscriber is physically located. A second use case is this whole area of customer experience management, which is generating so much buzz these days. So in many markets in the more developing regions, operators are facing a very high number of prepaid customers who really think nothing of swapping out their SIM cards to get the best possible deal, which means low customer loyalty, low revenue per user, and very high churn rates. Now, contextual policy can help operators mitigate that as well as increase their revenue by things like identifying those customers with a high propensity to churn, um, and then offering targeted offers or promotions to those customers. So, for example, DST Brunei is using subscriber data to support automated real-time campaign management and delivering contextual campaigns and rewards. You could also leverage other customer data, things like location or demographics, to identify cross-sell, upsell opportunities, which allows you to do more targeted marketing, offer variable charging based on who the subscriber is, um, any number of options. And then having that sort of subscriber information as the basis for those policy decisions enables the operator to be more consistent in how it treats the customer, regardless of service or device or access network. And that's an important part of an overall customer experience management strategy. And then finally, there's the topic of shared data plans. There's been a lot of interest, particularly in the more developed markets like North America and, and Western Europe, in these new pricing models in which a volume of data is shared among family members or employees, or maybe a single subscriber has a, a bucket of data for multiple devices like smartphones or tablets. And that's generated a lot of interest among operators who are looking to move away from their traditional all-you-can-eat models or even tiered services. However, once there's no longer a one-to-one -one relationship between the subscription and the user or the user and the device, the operator needs to be able to identify individual users or devices within that shared data plan. And then once that occurs, there's the opportunity to target specific members of that data plan. Um, for example, you could send an offer directly to uh, kids' sh uh, smartphones if you're talking about a family plan. Or you could enable parents or employers to set very specific usage controls within that shared bucket of data, whether you're talking about data caps or something maybe as sophisticated as a granular control over what services kids are allowed to access and when, or what, what uh, websites or what uh, applications you want your employees to be able to access while they're w during work hours. And while I think all operators offering shared data plans need to be able to offer their subscribers some degree of control over individual devices or users within those plans, they really have the opportunity as well to monetize that control, such as Verizon Wireless is doing. They're offering usage controls to uh, share data customers for a premium. So what does this mean for the market overall? Well, for one thing, over the past 12 to 18 months, we've really seen the role of policy management expanding beyond its traditional role. It's moved beyond its position in the network realm and its traditional function of bandwidth management to encompass a new range of operator requirements. And the interesting thing is, as that's occurred, we've seen policy investments no longer being made solely based on the technology. So increasingly, RFPs and RFIs are requiring not just specific technical features, things like standards compliance and, and scalability requirements, but also a range of use cases that the operator can implement with a minimum of customization. And then we're going to see more and more of a focus on analytics solutions being deployed hand in hand with policy, given that, as I pointed out, the power of a policy management system really lies in the information being supplied to it. So as operators shift their focus from network policy to service and subscriber policy, they're increasingly recognizing that they need to be able to gather and analyze data about services and about customers 
and then make policy decisions based on that information. And as these shifts occur, we expect to see the network landscape changing as well to meet these new challenges. So while network equipment suppliers were the earliest providers of policy management solutions, we've seen operators increasingly looking to invest in solutions from independent software providers to meet their requirements, and we expect that to continue, particularly as these vendors expand and evolve their solutions to encompass capabilities such as subscriber management, real-time charging, and analytics. So just a couple of points to, to wrap up with. Um, really, the, this concept of contextual policy is really fitting into a number of larger initiatives within the operator. Um, they're taking a different approach to how they manage bandwidth by encouraging more efficient bandwidth utilization and better tying bandwidth consumed to the price being charged rather than just uh, limiting or blocking consumption. It's increasingly part of network upgrade projects, both 3G and LTE, in terms of helping operators better monetize these investments. And then finally, it's supporting larger customer experience management initiatives by providing operators with a way to offer their subscribers and their prospects more creative and more targeted services that are consistent across multiple delivery mechanisms and multiple end user devices. And with that, I'm going to hand the reins back over to Jeff. Thank you, Shira, for that uh, excellent presentation and overview of uh, policy management and subscriber engagement. Our next speaker is John Geary, who is CEO and President of Openway Mobility. John, thanks for joining us today. Jeff, thank you. Shira, thank you. Really appreciate the setup here. So. I think I'm going to start with a key image I want us all to think about. And it's around the scissors problem. Shira did a beautiful job of laying out the macro level uh, movement around uh, joblessness and concerns in Europe, the double digit growth of smartphones. Rather than go into that in more detail, I just leave us with two thoughts. There was a, a recent McKinsey report, um, which traced back to the mid 2000s pre smartphone, where they outlined a tenfold decrease in average revenue per gigabyte. And I think what the problem that demonstrates is when you have a market with the demand, as Shira outlines well, and against a cost structure that needs to support that demand, and that kind of decrease in constant real dollars, you have a real dilemma. And the only thing a scissors is good for initially is cutting things. But even if you look at the recent uh, marketplace and, and some of the reports, the quarterly reports by many of um, the large vendors or large operators, you can see inside all of that a clear need to do something dif different. Cutting costs is only going to bring us to a certain point in time. We need to go and turn around and reverse and create a new average service uh, profitability per user. And that's going to take a dramatic change in how we think of our users. To be profitable, we must create a positive customer engagement experience, as Shira ended her presentation with. Um, this is the kind of experience that our customers are getting from the various competitors, be they device and platform, be they over-the-top applications. We must create our own space, our own opportunity, and drive a delightful and profitable customer experience. So let's take a look at what that's going to involve. There are a variety of pricing plans, but fundamentally there's pretty much three customer levers around the world that we're pushing these days. One is around devices. Frankly, not much in our control. It's around the iOS, the Android, the Microsoft platforms, and the devices that um, display those and make those usable. Um, that's a third-party driver. Uh, we can do different packaging, we can do different things, but there's not much to influence it. A lot's been made of speed. There's constant 2G, 3G, 4G, the speed, the latency, and certainly the quality of experience, as we know in our software, is absolutely vital. But it's pretty difficult to create a pricing plan that somebody's going to find a unique and delightful customer experience. And finally, we're primarily charging people on a metric, megabytes, gigabytes, which is quite frankly, outside of a sophisticated audience like the folks on this call, extremely difficult for people to understand, plan, and enjoy 
uh, uh, and delight in accessing services when they're charged on a metric that, quite frankly, they don't even fully understand and couldn't explain to one another if asked. And like so many great moments in history, uh, there is another revolution, another French revolution, which quite frankly was the dawn of the American democracy. Uh, and this revolution is about the marketplace where one of the carriers, Free Mobile, has brought its broadband offering, its low cost, very thrifty, very capable broadband offering into the mobile side and created a significant market inflection point. Uh, to the point where one of the primary carriers, for example, Orange and Le Tribune, it's noted, is delivering three times the data for one-third the cost in just the last 12 months. Um, all of the respective competitors in that marketplace have taken significant um, cost against their bottom line, including having to reduce uh, personnel and cost structures in accordance with this. But as I said, back in the scissors, that's a very limited, uh, unexciting, and frankly unstimulating response in the end of the day. So we need to pull new business levers. It's absolutely imperative that we redefine the relationship with the customer. We expand their personal choices as they're accustomed to in this new economy. And we work hard to increase the perceived value of the services we deliver. But it's not just enough to go repackage our present plans, create new uh, giveaways or new incentives, because a lot has changed over the last couple of years in a parallel manner to the advent of the smartphone. And primarily it's around the economy, the new economy of micropayments. Purchase what you need when you need it. You know, as far back as eight or nine years ago when Steve Jobs first introduced iTunes, we went from a CD packaging to a digital single. And I was recently reading his biography. That was a dramatic change in the music industry, and one in which was very difficult for many of the main competitors and artists to adjust to. You come a little closer, nearer now, you look at assets all the way from a bike, which could be thousands of dollars, to a car, which would be hundreds, potentially hundreds of thousands of euros. No longer is that asset seen as a purchase asset, but more and more frequently, particularly in urban centers, you've seen the proliferation of the bike stands, where you rent by the hour, rent by the day. You purchase what you need when you need it. Zipcar, one of the fastest growing companies here in the Bay Area where I live, is all about being able to rent a car literally by the half hour, and literally you can rent the insurance and all the other requirements around driving a car for that period in time, only what you need when you need it. I, I'll digress slightly. There's a fascinating example now in the Bay Area here in San Francisco. Uh, many of you might relate to this. As you travel around the world, much like myself, um, there's now a service that will rent out your house while you're traveling uh, by the night. Um, these kind of innovative new models absolutely are aimed at the type of subscribers that we're going to need to appeal to. And thus, we're going to need them, give them very personal choices in the manner they can consume that they're comfortable consuming with. So what does this mean for our industry? What does this mean for the way in which we service our customers? What it means is we're going to have to look at all the evolving data pricing levers. Today our software supports all of these in this time frame and there's more that we're bringing on by the day. It's time. So why are we charging people in gigabits? As, as Michael Rogers, our head of uh, products management here in Price Plan Innovation will show us, there's a great unleashed power to be able to charge people video in and around the time consumption versus the gigabyte consumption. We can certainly uh, cater to their device needs uniquely. We can certainly continue to cater to speed. We can cater to their individual user preferences, as Shira noted, around analytics, where we look at a lot of the URL traffic and try to prompt people for discounted services to news sites, et cetera. Certainly around apps. A group plan we've recently introduced is all about bringing the group plan and being able to share data. Content, there's high def content coming every day. Sponsorship, time of day access. The fundamental point is we can create multiple associations unique to individual users and therefore be able to establish a new personalized value 
that's in line with the new economy of micropayments and microconsumption. The way we look at that and the way we do that is by embracing the power of the PCC ecosystem. It's out there, as Shira noted, it's become much more sophisticated. It's evolving from its basic, you know, I'll, I'll think of it as voiceover, LTE uh, voice. Uh, it's now evolving into data. It's evolving from the sledgehammer approach that was at one point primarily orientated around sending policies to block to now much more intelligent policy management. And to that end, we've had numerous conferences, webinars, all kinds of discussion around policy control. I, I think we all know that area pretty darn well. We've had an equal amount around policy enforcement uh, at the platform level, like you do with our Integra platform. What I'm advocating today where we haven't had enough discussion is around the policy engagement which is specific to the customer experience. And they get that experience via a variety of ways. A toolbar, real-time inline notification, redirects to web portals, push notification, SMS. But all of that summarizes up to the customer policy engagement or experience. And this is where we're going to make our money. This is where policy control and policy enforcement manifests itself for an end user. This is why they want our service. And this is where we delight them. And I'm going to have Michael show us a, a live demonstration of, of how that works. Okay. There are three core principles that you'll note in this demonstration. One, we've designed our software to fit the activity. You're on the move. It's no longer a web stationary based experience. It's got to be easy to understand, simple to use, and fast. And it's got to engage the customer, excite the customer. Let's delight the customer. Do it in the way in which we see the device and the platform and the applications from over the top uh, focus on. And that brings us into a brand, and I use that term as a former CMO of a number of major companies for a specific reason. It's a brand new service as well. It's the way in which we want our customers to experience us and to delight in what we provide them. So as I said, we create services with new met metrics. A time dimension might be one. An application and a variety of other dimensions are possible. We introduce lower cost data plan options so that people can gradually become accustomed to data, the cost associated with data, and become enthusiastic users of our service. It allows us to upsell services as add-ons, engage them in line, engage them real time, engage them in a manner in which they can consume what they want, when they want it. No surprises. We had a brief period there where we were providing a lot of PR to the people who are the skeptics of the communications business with the bill shock, the roaming, the other types of services that often catch people after the fact and create poor customer experiences in poor PR. And finally, and most important, we can empower these users through the self-care service that's available to them. Let them make the choices, let them decide what's best, and let them enjoy the experience they want to enjoy. And now, as I said, I'd like to turn this over to Michael Rogers. Michael is our head of product management for the Price Plan Innovation software suite, which powers this solution. Michael? Hey, thank you, John. Um, so as John said, I just wanted to, um, I guess, illustrate what, what he's been talking about in terms of how, how to sell um, a, a service such as video in a seamless manner to users as a, as a if you will, an add-on service in this, in this micropayment economy. So um, what I'm going to show you here is, is really a typical user experience of what it might look like. So here we have, I'm just going to start playing, we have a user who is basically um, going to go to YouTube. Uh, in this particular case, the YouTube uh, is, is restricted from them, video is restricted from their plan. So we're going to see some evidence here of user engagement, both in line in the video, as you can see, and through a push notification as appearing on the screen, giving the user the ability to seamlessly go through to self-care and to purchase a plan in line. In this case, they're buying premium video, one hour access. And after that, they get redirected. Uh, the self-care shows that they've now got a video plan and they, they can then continue to go back to YouTube 
and immediately uh, re restart the, the video and uh, you know the policy is updated in real time and the user gains access to that video content. So it's as simple as that. It's the idea of engaging the user, as John has indicated, in line and giving them options on how to proceed. Um, so what I wanted to do now as well is look at a little bit you know, under the bonnet in terms of how do you actually implement this type of solution such as uh, selling video on demand. Um, if we look um, here, this is basically, um, I guess, a, a more architecture sort of view of, of our, our, our solution in network. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I wanted to run through here in, in slide mode. So first of all, we have a user who is entering uh, the system. We're sitting uh, between the access uh, network and the internet. Uh, making a video request, um, we're also receiving on the control pane their identity, which we can use to resolve into uh, some policy details. In this particular example, in real time, we're pushing down to the enforcement layer that this user is restricted uh, of accessing video. So when the video request is made, we need the enforcement layer essentially to monitor that traffic. And once they identify that the user is accessing video, then we have a traffic steering function happening. Um, this then will basically invoke our um, user engagement uh, module, if you will, which informs the user of why they're restricted uh, through mechanisms such as inline video notification or push notification as is depicted here. Um, and then the user can do something about that. So how, how do we go about buying a plan? So in this particular example, we have the user purchasing a video pass. What is happening then is a number of back-end um, uh, activities. One is that the user is billed for the service, so we have real-time interaction with a billing system, charging the user for the fee that uh, uh, was indicated. We have a provisioning activity where the plan is updated to their profile in real time. And we also have, more importantly, the real-time update of policy so that the restriction that previously applied is no longer there. This means that the user can then access the video uh, immediately, and what we see then is the video played as the example showed and they have access to self-care to monitor uh, how much time they have remaining if they pur purchase say that video uh, by BR. So that's just an illustrative example of how you actually make something like that real uh, and that's how our, our solution would actually implement such a solution. Um, I'm going to move forward now um, and before we close I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about um, basically uh, uh, some examples in the industry that we've seen in rolling out service-oriented pricing models uh, and the success that we've seen. There's been some key learnings and I wanted to share some of them with you. So um, I guess um, what we're seeing is certainly for uh, any of the operators that we have dealt with who have rolled out this type of um, uh, service-oriented pricing, there has been a significant upside in terms of ARPU. And that has been mainly due to the fact that users are compelled to buy these add-on purchases, these micropayment purchases that John referred to. Um, in terms of adoption, again, we're seeing a very significant uptake, um, one in five, which is, you know, if you look at and compare that to mobile advertising, where the click-through rate is much, much, much smaller. Um, and what we feel is the main reason behind this is the fact that the actual engagement is happening in real time. The engagement is contextual, it's meaningful, and it's valuable to the end user, so they are much more likely to uptake that offer. Um, what is also important is that when you're rolling out these form of service-based pricing, it's important that you provide the user with choice uh, to, to maximize, from an operator perspective, your, your, your margins. So what I, I mean by that is that you have some low-cost options where you know, a user could buy video by the hour, or they may also have a higher-cost option where they would buy it for, say, um, a week or 30 days uh, at a higher fee. Having a mix of those two options means you're going to maximize your uptake and maximize your revenue. Um, and finally, um, as is illustrated in the solutions we've just been showing, um, there's a, a great deal of self-care, so the user takes is more empowered to take control over the service. And this has a clearly a, a positive impact from an end user perspective, but also from a customer care perspective, um, it reduces the amount of customer care calls that we typically see going into the operator on rolling out these type of services, which saves them money in the, in the long term. So uh, there are some basically insights into the evidence we've seen in the market today of this type of pricing working very effectively, mainly due to the fact that we are embracing this policy engagement um, element in, in our solution, something that we feel is, is, is missing uh, to a great part to date in the market. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to just close. Um, basically, I would encourage you to, to come and, and visit our site. Um, it's openwebmobility.com. Uh, and also, for all of you that have registered for this webinar, there is a, uh, a related white paper that will be made available to you uh, on tiered pricing evolution and uh, on service-based pricing. Um, I, want to, I want to close. OK, uh, I'm just going to hand you back to John now for a second. I'm sorry, Michael. Um, I just wanted to say in uh, one last closing remark um, around this is hopefully in this particular sequence of slides, we've rapidly and quickly taken you through the challenges as well as the opportunities. And we've shown you how to take the scissors and not use it for cutting costs, but rather for cutting the cord to our past pr price plan offerings and developing new and innovative offerings. As Michael notes, we have the URL here where you can go and look at the presentation after we've completed it, as well as a new white paper we have specifically addressing this area. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to Jeff now. Uh, great. John, Michael, Shira, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is launch the uh, a second poll uh, just quickly before we get into the Q&A. Um, and the second question you can see on your screen now. And again, if, if folks could just take a minute and respond, we'll leave this open for a, a few seconds, about 30 seconds before we move into the Q&A. And just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, uh, audience can please submit the uh, questions you may have as we get ready for Q&A. A link to this uh, broadcast will be made available. And we'll be sending that to all the folks who registered for the webinar as well as the, uh, who actually attended the webinar. So the question on the, on the table today is, mobile data consumption continues to grow. What pricing models do you feel will be most effective going forward? We're going to leave it up for just a few more seconds as the votes continue to come in. Okay, I'll leave it open for five seconds more. If you haven't voted, please add your your vote. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. And John, before we dive into some of the questions we've got, or, or uh, Michael, uh, love your comments or feedback on this uh, on the responses you see to this poll. Is this consistent with what you've been seeing in the market? I would say yes. Um, it's interesting because the poll is kind of inverse of how people are implementing in the market, and, and, and since the question wasn't that, of course. But if you look at it, you know the variety. You know the variety of plans are there, but the 80/20 rule applies. It's it's primarily based around volume, uh, megabytes and gigabytes. I do think there's a great interest. We're having um, a number of um, customers, as you know, we noted, are, are starting to introduce this software. I think the activity next year will be extremely high because I think as reflected here, um, the value-based pricing is really important. I'm certainly sympathetic to the content provider contributing. That has proven to be an elusive goal. And, you know, I, I can tell you living here in Silicon Valley and talking with these folks on a regular basis, um, they don't see that as their obligation. Um, more education, more opportunity, more creating value for them will help. But at the present time, it is challenging to have that on an industry-wide level. There may be individual operators who can, but it's nonetheless challenging on an industry-wide level. OK. Well, thank you. Let's move into the uh, Q&A. And uh, share this first question is for you. Uh, what do you see as the key factors in providing effective user management, or I'm sorry, user engagement solutions? There's a, there's a couple of, uh, of components that I think you really need to keep in mind. One is sort of that the power of the policy engine. Um, I think it's incredibly important that it be flexible, that it be powerful enough to support the number, the, the transaction volume that some of these new approaches are, are going to generate. Um, the, the other important uh, factor is how you're treating your subscriber data. 
I think typically within most operators, at least most of the, uh, particularly the tier ones, you have multiple silos of subscriber information located in you know any number of places with very little ability to do any kind of a, a consolidation or centralization of subscriber data. So I, I think the first step is really to, to take a hard look at how you're treating your subscriber data and figure out some sort of a strategy, whether you're talking about an actual federation or more of a virtualized approach. And, and that's kind of the basis for the sort of analysis that I, I spoke about. OK. Um, open way, folks. Any comments there or any additional thoughts? I think Shira has given a, a pretty good overview. I mean, we have an analytics engine that operates within our platform domain on layer 7 and provides a lot of insight, uh, particularly to usage and to uh, <coughs> marketing folks, excuse me. Um, but it, it is a relatively fragmented um, area. There's um, a lot of uh, good analytics you can get at layer 2, layer 3. I, I think over the next uh, 12 months or so, there's more and more work going in. We're certainly doing it to integrate those into a, into a common uh, database that can be accessible and easy to use to make response marketing decisions and responsive traffic management decisions as the situations evolve. And, and they evolve very quickly. I mean, video growth is growing exponentially faster than we projected even a year ago or two years ago. The particular types of behavior on smartphones are quite unique, as we've seen iPhone being very different from an Android experience and, and consumption and, and overall. So this analytics is vital to making sure that the customer experience is both delightful and profitable. OK. Um, and Michael, um, I'll direct this one to you. How do you ensure a balanced approach to user engagement where you avoid the negative perception of either spam or, or Big Brother? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's a good question. Um, Basically, you know, I think, and I hope um, it was uh, it was relayed in the in the earlier part of the webinar. Um, user engagement, you know, clearly has to be, um, you know, has to use the right medium. Um, I think it needs to be um, aware of the device and its capabilities. Um, but a very important aspect is that it it needs to be contextually aware, so relevant to the activity that the user is doing at that time, because otherwise it can be perceived as being um, a nuisance. And um, you know, basically, it will be perceived as spam. So I think what the key points are is that it has to be real time, it has to be contextually aware, and it has to suit the activity and suit the the medium or the capability of the device. So, for example, um, you know, we have seen quite a bit of uh, negative press around things like push notification being overused by applications. Uh, to a degree that users really kind of ignore a lot of those messages today in, in apps. So that's a, an example, I guess, of a you know a misuse of a, a technology. Uh, you know, so it's it's really important that you know that the owners of the application, in this case, um, also the operator, that they uh, they use it in in a way that's meaningful to the user, um, and that the user can actually also that it's two way, that it's not just a one way. That the user can easily interact with that notification, uh, follow through. Uh, to a promotion or a purchase or whatever it might be, um, and, and that way, then I think you will get a, a positive user experience rather than a negative. Okay, I've got a um, audience question here, which I think I hear quite often, and the question is: There's so many PCRF vendors these days. What are the the key parameters uh, which folks should use to be evaluating these PCRF vendors? Um, I'll start with a, a couple of comments from me. Um, I think um, what I think is really important is uh, that the um, that policy, as we see, policy has, has evolved quite a bit in the last number of years, and it needs to evolve further. Um, so one one clear uh, aspect I would see is that there needs to be, um, I guess, uh, longevity in the solution that it's capable of um, implementing new use cases. Uh, as seamlessly and as effectively as possible, and that does not require redesign or re-architecture. So it needs to have a it needs to be a design, a flexible design, so that users or, or operators can actually uh, evolve as we move to more advanced policy uh, models. Some of which we've, we've talked about or alluded to in this webinar. Uh, I think that's a key aspect. Uh, I think another aspect that clearly is um, scalability. Um, you know, it has to scale in line with the actual volume of traffic that we're seeing in mobile. 
um, and they, clearly the amount of signaling traffic is going to grow as well. So uh, there has been some concerns in the market about that of recent times. Um, PCRFs need to be uh, able to um, to cope with that traffic. They also need to be able to, I think, uh, delegate uh, responsibility to some of the more uh, advanced enforcement points in the network, so that they're not the um, you know required for every policy decision. Uh, I think that's really, from a practical perspective, that needs to happen. So there would be some some points that I would uh, that would I would uh, uh, put in place if you are evaluating a, a, a PCRF vendor. I think it's important to note that in our deployments, we interoperate with a variety of PCRF vendors. Uh, and as Michael said, um, there are a number of ways we evaluate our partnerships with them to find the best ones. And there's and that segment continues to evolve um, in terms of requirements and their ability to meet them. OK, good. Uh, and I have another question from the audience. And um, it, 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 I'll just read it to you. Do you see this as a host of solutions smaller regional carriers could share? And it's, the question specifically asked about, um, you know, is, it, is the cost for the technology geared for carriers with maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of customers? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've built it very modular and scalable. In fact, the way, if you go to our website, the way we package is it's a single platform, but with modules around different types of services, be they data plans, be they video tethering, et cetera. So we've built this in mind to be very elastic and very capable of servicing small regional carriers to large global carriers. Um, obviously, size and scale is, is a lot dicta dictates some of the, the, the cost structure here. We've also built it um, as an evolution into a um, software-defined network, into a hosted or cloud-based. At the present time, we don't see the present demand driving that. Most folks, particularly marketing departments, like to have control over their individual plans and be able to access those and change those and evolve those accordingly. But certainly over time, I could um, and would be open to discuss in any way how this could be um, a multi-tenant solution. <laughs> okay, and, and Shira, I noticed. Uh, did you have any comment going back to the challenges or the uh, the criteria uh, carriers should use in evaluating PCRF uh, uh, opportunities? Would you do you have any other comments there or thoughts? Yeah, actually, we we just uh, conducted a survey of operators on on sort of their policy management priorities and strategies, and you know, first of all, to agree completely with Michael. Uh, scalability is incredibly important, as he pointed out. I think there have been some uh, some concerns as transaction volumes and signaling traffic ramps up, having a solution that can support that. The other thing that, that really came across is the importance of flexibility, particularly as you start talking about this next generation of policy as being more than just simple bandwidth management. If you're talking about having it be an enabler for some advanced use cases, that ability to to customize, to, to really not have to go back to your vendor for every single customization becomes more and more important. Uh, and, you know, and interestingly, uh, we, we've seen things like uh, price become less and less important, and I really think that's because we're seeing operators view this as such a strategic capability going forward that they're, they're really looking for that high quality, very scalable, very robust solution. Thank you. Um... You know, John, you and I bump into each other at various shows all around the all around the world, and I guess I want to kind of get under the hood for a minute on a question. And that is, in your mind's eye, you know, what are some of the specific challenges that folks are having deploying these solutions? Um, I mean, they seem very natural as a way to upsell and uh, really provide a better experience and a better service. But as you look across the board, what are some of the uh, challenges carriers are having deploying these type of solutions? <laughs> Um, so I, I would put them in, into two categories. Um, one is being able to define that customer experience and know how you're going to execute on it. So going as, back as far as a year ago when I used to start these conversations uh, with various operators that have now matured into real opportunities in business. I myself started probably on the wrong end of the stick, as did we often in our conversations, because most of the conversations were about all the infinite possibilities one could do. 
And certainly, you know, with technology and, and the platforms such as ourselves, I can present an infinite number of use cases that could drive potential revenue. What that leads is to an inability to make a decision sometimes. And so one of the key learnings we adapted was you've got to focus. You've got to start somewhere. I encourage anyone to not get caught up in overthinking of it. There, there is a valley saying that, you know, failure to act is certain death. And I think that's really what defines this is, and that's why we put these packages together as we've presented them, uh, because as Shira said, you've got to be flexible, you've got to be quick, you've got to try. Um, some things will work very well, some things will work medium well, and some things may not work well at all. But as long as you can contain the exposure in all of those so that clearly the successes outweigh the failures, that's the critical piece of this. And that's the piece we're focused on. Make these packages, wrap them up, clearly define them, clearly define the value proposition for both the operator and the end user, and then put a marketing plan around those that accentuates the value of those offerings. Drive them, try them, iterate them, and succeed with them. So that's number one. It's, it's about the fear of failure. Number two, and I think Shira indicated, there are still remaining a lot of challenges, and they're not technical. Um, in most of these cases, I could quickly come in and show you how in a 90-day period I'd have your service up and running uh, and you'd start introducing it to customers. But that does involve, it's not simplistic to involve the cross-collaboration essential to making this successful. Because it's not singularly a technical decision. It's not singularly a market decision. It's a company decision. And, and the, the companies that can focus on the end user quickly and bring the various parties to the table can rapidly focus on introducing the right type of solution. Because the solution is going to provide a customer experience critical to marketing. It does sit in the network today, so it's got to make sure that it operates and interoperates as we accentuate with all the various pieces of a network, be they DPI, be they PCRFs. And then finally, the analytics has to be gathered and created so that it's useful. And therefore, some thought has to go into what are we looking for. Again, another complexity there is you can produce reports ad infinitum. The value of the reports are only what gets done with them. Got it. Okay, we've got time for a couple other questions. Cher, I want to come back. Uh, were you finished, John? I'm sorry. Yep, I'm perfectly okay. fine. Thank you. Yeah. So Cher, what, uh, what trends are you seeing in emerging markets with respect to policy control and charging? Are they the same in markets with higher smartphone penetration? Um, interesting question. Not, not so much. What we're really seeing in the more developed markets is much of the, the driver is behind three, uh, LG net, uh, I'm sorry, LTE networks. So uh, their operators are making this type of investment in the network infrastructure. They want to make sure that they can, I mean, I, I think the word monetize is kind of overused, but I think here it's, it's probably appropriate. They, they want to make sure they're getting their investment back. The developing markets are interesting. It, it tends to be more around uh, subscriber churn, around campaign management. Uh, you know, as I noted in my presentation, we have very high uh, churn rates in those markets, very low ARPU, um, and, and you know, subscribers who really think nothing of, of kind of swapping out swim, SIM cards to get the best possible deal. So the idea is to really create a more sticky customer, raise revenue per user, um, and, and sort of address the, the really high volume of, of customers that are coming online uh, on a monthly basis. Okay, we've got time for um, one final question here. And, and John, or Mike, uh, Michael, I'll leave it up to you. We had a question about the 1-800 data services uh, sounding like a great idea, but maybe uh, difficult uh, to implement. Or um, the, the other question that's kind of pending here is um, with LT adding capacity, why should operators diversify in their data pricing models beyond simple usage and bandwidth tiered pricing? I'll quickly yeah. answer the second one with one line, and then I'm going to ask Michael to take the. So you're adding capacity. What if it's unprofitable capacity? Michael, you go ahead and take the yeah. first question. Sure. Um, so yeah, the one eight hundred data service. I mean, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, I think, uh, and we're certainly seeing a lot of uh, uh, talk about it in the U.S. market. Um, so conceptually, you know, people get it. It's it's an easy concept, and and, and voice it's well understood. 
and very successful. Um, I think for it to work in data, uh, I think a couple of things need to happen. Obviously, the, uh, there needs to be, I think, a collaborative effort for sure. Uh, the, the OTT players need to see value uh, in, in why they should pay, say, the operator for, for uh, access to the service as opposed to charging the subscriber. So there needs to be a, a compelling uh, argument made there. Um, the, the other piece, I guess, which I think is a, more of a, a challenge to the operators is that the actual, uh, in, in providing the service, it has to be um, you know, as well defined as it can be. And, and one of the problems, I guess, that you, know, you see with 800 is that you know what what constitutes 800 data, what constitutes not. If I've got free Facebook, but I've got links from that page, are they free? If I go to YouTube from Facebook, is that free? So basically, the definition of the service needs to be clear, no ambiguity, so that the end user understands what they're getting for free, and and, and the operators plus the, the the provider of that service is not subject to leakage. Um, I think you know there there are challenges, but I think um, I think we are already seeing some evidence of uh, you know kind of uh, a similar type of uh, service has been offered. We're seeing relationships, say, with like in Spotify and in, in, in Europe, uh, um, working with a number of operators to provide, you know, their service as part of a data plan, so that basically you get essentially free access to Spotify as part of your plan. So that's a kind of a manifestation of it. Uh, and I do see. I think we'll have, you know, it won't. It'll be some time before it's ubiquitous. Uh, but I think we will see more and more uh, collaboration between the operator and content providers to go to the players to provide these type of services, and I'm, I'm confident it will happen. Great. Well, listen, I want to thank uh, Shira. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, John and Michael, it's always a pleasure. Uh, all the audience, thank you for joining us. This presentation will be made available on demand. You'll receive a link in the next 24 hours with access to this uh, presentation. Um, the questions that were submitted will be given over to Mobile Wave, uh, Open Wave, and um, Infinetics, and they'll be getting back to the um, folks who did ask questions. So, uh, at this time, we'll wrap up today's webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us.